we found uh, a lot of utilities having trouble filling cybersecurity positions, but they were also asking for something similar. They wanted a bachelor's degree and they wanted five years experience. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Industrial Security Podcast. My name is Nate Nelson. I'm here with Andrew Ginter, Vice President of Industrial Security at Waterfall Security Solutions. He's going to introduce the subject and the guest of today's show. Andrew, how are you? I'm very well. Thank you, Nate. Our guest today is Steve Parker. He is the president at EnergySec. And our topic is building your own workforce. Uh, Steve and EnergySec are working to create the world's first industrial security apprenticeship program. Okay, then without further ado, here's you and Steve. Hello, Steve, and thanks for joining us. Um, before we dive into the details here, can, can you start by telling us a bit about yourself and about EnergySec? Absolutely. Uh, first off, you know, going going back to you know my my early days, I did get a bit of a late start in tech in technology. Um, there weren't a great number of computer jobs when I graduated high school in the mid '80s, uh, so it was really around the year 2000, uh, late '90s, around 2000, when I got into technology in particular, um, and specifically cybersecurity. I, I did get early in on the cybersecurity wave. Um, my first full time job in cybersecurity uh, was in 2000, so relatively early uh, from this uh, from this profession. And I think I've had, a, had some luck and I got a, got a few breaks along the way. Um, I think the big one was in 2001. I had an opportunity to join a burgeoning cybersecurity team at a electric utility by the name of Pacific Corp, a very large investor-owned utility based in Portland, Oregon. And had no idea what I was in for when I started there, but it's been uh, quite quite the ride in the electric sector. I uh, spent about eight years there, did just about everything you can do in cybersecurity. Um, a lot of project work, uh, did some mainframe security, did firewalls, did forensics, investigations. Um, and towards the end of my career there, I got into this thing called NERC SIP, uh, burgeoning cybersecurity regulations for electric utilities. And then in 2009, I went over to the dark side for a little while and I became an official NERC SIP auditor working for the Western Electricity Coordinating Council or WAC, which was the compliance authority for the Western part of the United States. So I got to see the regulatory side from the regulatory side. Um, was there for about 14 months. And then in 2010, I had the opportunity to join EnergySec full-time, uh, and never really looked back since then. Now, EnergySec, as is, is perhaps some folks know, uh, we are a nonprofit organization. Uh, our roots go back to the early 2000s, where uh, we were a volunteer organization made up of professionals from the electric sector seeking to collaborate on cybersecurity, physical security, business continuity, and the uh, budding compliance regulations that were coming about in the in the mid 2000s. So I joined in, in 2010 as part of the, the leadership team. And then in 2013, I took over as president and have been leading the organization ever since. Uh, what EnergySec does, among other things, uh, we're very big on the education side. Uh, we do a lot of professional education around the NERC SIP standards. We do some around cybersecurity. We also produce events. Uh, for example, our annual summit is going into its 16th year this year, and we're happy to be back in person this October in Anaheim, California at the Disneyland Resort. So if you're looking for an excuse for a Disney getaway, uh, check us out, and you might want to come attend our event there. Uh, so we do a lot of things. Our, our overall mission is to help electric utilities be more secure, um, in, a, in a nutshell. Uh, I also do a little bit of consulting. I'm a partner in a consulting firm known as Archer. Uh, and then from a certification perspective, I hold a CISA and a CISSP. I've had those for about 15 years. I keep paying them money every year, and they keep letting me use the letters So for what those are worth. Um, so that's me. Cool. I mean, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're one of the originals. I remember back in the, uh, you know, the early 1990s, people were posting jobs, different topic, Unix, uh, needed 20 years experience in Unix in 1991. 
There were only two people on the planet that had 20 years experience with Unix. That was Kernighan and Ritchie. Um, you know, we're at the same point with industrial security. Uh, you know, people posting jobs needed 20 years experience with industrial security. Um, there's not that many people. You're one of them. So thanks for joining us. Glad to be here. Now, our topic is, uh, you know, workforce development, building your own workforce. Um, you know, I understand that you folks are working on the world's first industrial security apprenticeship program. Can you talk about that? Give us the big picture. What is that? Where did it come from? Well, well first of all, I'm not 100% sure we are the first, but we are certainly probably early, uh, early on in, in this model. Um, I think I, I want to play off something you mentioned. Uh, you know, you mentioned you know, 1991, people asking for 20 years experience uh, on Unix. We see the same thing happening now with industrial security. Um, in particular, uh, I'm going to go back about oh, probably six or seven years ago uh, in, you know, in talking with utilities and looking at job postings that were out there. We found uh, a lot of utilities having trouble filling cybersecurity positions. But they were also asking for something similar. They wanted a bachelor's degree and they wanted five years experience and very, very difficult to find uh, professionals at, at that level. And so, you know, I started getting the idea, well, you know, maybe we should we should build our own. And I started thinking about apprenticeships and the apprenticeship models uh, in the electric sector. It's used very widely in other professions. Uh, meter readers back when we had meter readers uh, today linemen uh, various journey level tradesmen from communication engineers to power systems engineers so the industry is familiar with the models but uh, for some reason it's never been applied to the more technical professions uh, you know IT for example or cybersecurity um, in those areas so I began thinking you know wouldn't it make sense to apply the model uh, of, of building and developing your own workforce rather than complaining that you can't find people with the requisite experience. Maybe you could find somebody with a two-year degree uh, and a year of experience, bring them on board, and then train them up specifically for what they need to know to, to work at a utility. So we began kind of socializing that idea uh, and got a lot of, kind of a lot of head nods, a lot of interest. Um, I actually hired uh, Twyla Denham, who is... Uh, I guess my, my secondhand woman at EnergySec, and she runs our workforce programs. So I hired her in 2015 to help socialize this model and begin work, working on it. We've done a variety of things on an informal basis. Um, one thing in particular, we, we spent some time looking for money, honestly. Being a nonprofit, uh, you know, you're always looking for money. So we went after some grants from the Department of Labor. And we were not successful in our first attempt, and we were not successful in our second attempt. But along the way, we did develop some great relationships. Uh, and then last year, we were successful uh, as part of a larger consortium in landing some money from the Department of Labor to work on this concept of cybersecurity-related apprenticeships uh, in the clean energy sector, um, as well as advanced manufacturing with some other partners. So um, along the way, you know, we've been involved in a variety of things. We've, we've done work with community colleges. I've uh, uh, participated in uh, grant oversight um, committees on, on a couple of National Science Foundation awards. Uh, Twyla has been very involved with the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education and their working groups, as well as working groups at the Department of Labor. So we developed a lot of great relationships in academia as well as within government. Uh, and we were able to leverage that and help me put together uh, this consortium that received funding last year. Uh, now, unfortunately, we received word of that funding on March 1st of 2020. Uh, and just as we were getting off the ground, COVID hit. So as you can imagine, that put a little bit of a damper on our efforts for a good part of the year. Um, but now we're starting to, to really gain momentum. We're, we're getting some legs underneath us with things reopening. Um, we've got folks interested. We've got some small uh, areas of interest where we have folks from industry that are collaborating with, with us and starting to kind of draft out what these things are going to look like. And, and so we're, you know, we're getting moving and excited about it. Andrew, what you and Steve were saying at the, uh, at the beginning there about these companies sort of 
looking for perfect candidates right away in these new industries, you know, five years experience, 20 years of experience with Unix before you could have it. I think that rings really true with people of my generation. I think that any of our millennial listeners out there will uh, have had the experience of coming out of college only to find that all of the reasonable job postings out there are looking for 10 years of experience by the time you're age 20. Um, And that's just not possible. So I appreciate Steve's sort of apprenticeship approach. Absolutely. And, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a problem that's happened before. I mean, uh, it, the example I gave was, was Unix. Kernigan and Ritchie were the two guys who wrote the Unix operating system. Version one before, you know, the first time anyone ever, anyone else ever saw it came out in 1968. So in the early 1990s, you know, we're talking 25 years after 1968. To, to post a job saying you need 20 years experience with Unix means you had to get into Unix within the very first five years that it came out. And there were like a, a, you know, a dozen or two dozen people who got into it. You know, there's just, there's no one on the planet who meets that spec. So, you know, these specs are completely unrealistic. And in the industrial space, you know, if somebody posts a, a job right now saying industrial security, you need 20 years experience because we need a, a senior manager. There's nobody out there. I mean, um, the, the uh, you know, 9 11, uh, you know, 20 years ago was, was, uh, it was 2001. 9 11 happened. Um, you know, governments all over the world looked around and said, that was very bad. That represents a failure of imagination. We never imagined this kind of attack. Um, and then they looked around for another couple of years to about 2003 and said, what other things like this do we have to deal with? What other failures of imagination have we got here? And one of the, 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 domains that uh, a lot of governments came up with was industrial security, critical infrastructure, cybersecurity. They said, this is a, is a disaster waiting to happen. We have to fix this. And the big initiative started in 2003, 18 years ago. You want to know who's got 20 years experience in industrial security? You know, Eric Byers was, was writing papers on this before 2003. Joe Weiss was writing papers. There's a, you know, there might be 10 people in the world who are active in the space 20 years ago. So, you know, A, you've got to be realistic. And B, yeah, there's a real need for, for uh, bringing people up the learning curve into the workforce here. So maybe that can be of some comfort for listeners out there looking for work right now, right? Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, the fact that there's unrealistic job specs posted means go ahead and apply. They're not going to find who they're looking for. You know, uh, you know, let them find someone good like you. So can you go a little deeper for us? Um, you know, the, the industrial security space has a lot of different roles, a lot of different specialties. You know, I mean, everything from, you know, people with PhDs in, in engineering and, and other topics to, you know, people fresh out of school, uh, you know, learning the ropes. Can you talk about the level of this program? You know, who, who are you targeting as coming into the program? What kinds of roles are you training them for? Well, it's a good question. We get asked that a lot. Um, it's a difficult one to answer because, uh, you know, the short answer is all of the above. You know, we're, we're looking at programs that will build the workforce um, in, you know, electric, electric sector in particular being our niche. But I think as we put models together, those can be replicated across other areas of critical infrastructure and industrial security. So we aren't necessarily looking to create just a single program. What we're looking to do is really break ground on the model of building your own workforce, so to speak. So uh, we will we will have a variety of, of approaches. But <clears throat> with that said, there are a few a few key areas that we'll be putting most of our effort into. Uh, one, because we are funded, uh, at least portions of our work are being funded by the Department of Labor in the U.S. Uh, formal apprenticeships are, are going to be a key part of that. Um, that's what the Department of Labor wants. So. We'll be looking at those. Now, those are you know usually seen as entry level positions. I, I think you think of an apprentice, you think of somebody who's perhaps just out of high school. Um, maybe they've had a little bit of college, so they're fairly early in their career. Um, although they don't necessarily need to be. Uh, apprenticeships can be applied at mid career folks, uh, individuals that are maybe changing their career focus or want to pick up some additional skills for additional responsibility. Uh, folks transitioning out of the military, military for example, 
uh, bring a lot of very practical experience and education that they can apply into into this area. Uh, and so using an apprenticeship model to leverage their existing skills and experience and then fill in the gaps uh, could be a could be a great model. So with that in mind, uh, I just want to do, a, do a, a quick recap on what an apprenticeship is. Um, and there's a few key aspects in the, in the model. First of all, a job. So, so an apprenticeship, you are actually working while you learn, and that's a very key piece of it. So obviously there's a certain level of background experience and knowledge that's going to be required, but not necessarily a great deal. There will be on-the-job training. So it's a work, learn while you work. Um, so you'll be doing things that add value to an employer while also learning and growing your skill set. So there's an on-the-job training component. There's also related technical instruction or classroom instruction that would accompany that. Uh, that could be provided by a college or university, or in many cases, it's provided by industry organizations or labor organizations. And we're looking at all of those models. There's also mentoring. Uh, with an apprentice, usually there's a, a coworker. Uh, that's at journey level or higher level of experience that will oversee the on-the-job learning, uh, provide mentoring and individual instruction. That can be a bit challenging when we're building a workforce that doesn't exist in the quantity that we need. So we're, we're looking at uh, ways to innovate on that. Uh, and then ultimately, when you finish an apprenticeship, there is usually a credential or some method of recognizing that you have now achieved competency um, and or a journey level, so to speak. If you think of, uh, for example, my father was an electrician. So uh, an electrician, you go through an apprenticeship and then you reach that level of knowledge where you can get licensed as a journeyman uh, or journey person. And, and now you are you know, recognized as ha having that skill standard. So we're looking at all of those components Perhaps with some innovation around them, they may look a little bit different, uh, but basically all those components will be in the programs that we build. Um, another aspect is, you know, incumbent workers. I think a big part of our of our efforts will revolve around the existing workforce, not necessarily within security, but within operations. So those who who talk about the cybersecurity needs for industrial security, there's a lot of discussion about cybersecurity professionals needing to understand operations or engineering. And there's a, there's a strong element of truth to that. So rather than creating cybersecurity professionals and then teaching them engineering, another approach might be to take people who know engineering and know operations and teach them cybersecurity. And so we're looking at programs that would do just that. Uh, people working for utilities that understand how the business works, they know how a power plant operates or a substation or a control center, uh, and they want to move into the security world, well, we can add security skills uh, and knowledge and abilities to their existing foundation um, and end up with a very, very strong workforce. Um, we're looking at adding uh, along those lines. Uh, we actually have conversations going in the state of Washington right now uh, with pretty strong interest from the state labor organizations, uh, labor agencies, as well as some of the trade unions, looking at adding security skills or security knowledge into existing apprenticeship programs. So for example, we might take a lineman apprenticeship and teach them enough about cybersecurity so they can understand when they're installing equipment that maybe is networked. Um, maybe they're installing, uh, you know, line sectionalizers on, uh, on a distribution line that are SCADA operated. Uh, we want them to understand how a little bit about networks and a little bit about uh, maybe accounts and authentication so they can appreciate the security aspects of the equipment that they're installing. So we're looking at that, uh, at that as well. So, you know, in summary, uh, we will not be creating a single program. And I think there's an opportunity to use this model really across all aspects, all levels of, of knowledge and experience from entry level through mid-career and even people who are fairly advanced in their careers. Um, you know, I don't think anyone's too old. You know, any dog is too old to learn a new trick. So I think there's opportunities at all levels here. So, so what I heard is is that, you know, you've got, let's say, 
the 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 people who are not really who are not new to the the the, the workforce they're not entry level they've been there for 10 15 years they're designing let's say uh, you know new systems and putting them in um, and they need some security knowledge so this is sort of a a crash course in security for people who already know what they're doing and need to expand sort of their their scope of knowledge but on the other end of the uh, of the scale you know that's the the end i understand less um, you know when when you talk about you know, helping out with with uh, entry level positions. What is an entry level position in the in the electric sector? You know, uh, are we talking? I, I'm guessing we're not talking people who who disassemble malware. That's that's sort of a specialty. What what does an entry level person do with with industrial security in in the electric sector? That's that's a very good question, and I, I think it's one that we don't have the complete answer yet. Um, Cybersecurity tends to not be an entry-level profession. Uh, at least traditionally, many people came into security from other aspects of technology. Um, my own personal experience, I started off doing desktop support um, and then moved into server support and uh, got a break early on move, moving into cybersecurity. Uh, as the profession matures and as security teams get bigger, I think there's an opportunity for more differentiation in roles. And we've seen some of the larger utilities starting to break down those roles and starting to define career pathways in cybersecurity. So an entry-level position might simply be working at a security operations center, uh, reviewing logs, uh, responding to alerts, things of that nature. But from an apprenticeship perspective, it could start even before that. Um, For example, it's come up in conversations with uh, some utilities, perhaps looking at their desktop support teams or their server support teams, where you're not starting in security, you're starting in technology at a utility, and then you're learning security along the way. So when the time comes to move into that security role, you already have at least a portion of the knowledge and skills that you need to serve that role. And then you can continue to expand your capabilities as you grow in your career pathway in cybersecurity. So I think there could be multiple entry points and that's something that we're, that we're exploring. I, I don't think it's completely answered yet. Waterfall Security Solutions is the OT security company. If you're wondering what is the difference between a unidirectional gateway and a firewall, or a so-called unidirectional firewall, then you'll be interested in Waterfall's latest ebook. Firewalls are used throughout both industrial networks and enterprise networks. But best practice demands something stronger, something truly unidirectional at the ITOT interface. To see the difference that unidirectional security makes, please download the free ebook. Firewalls versus unidirectional gateways from the Waterfall website under the resources menu. I'm listening to to Steve here. Um, something I did not ask him was sort of, are there analogies for this kind of program out there in the world? But as I'm listening to him again, it occurs to me, you know, he mentioned he has a CISSP. I have a CISSP credential as well, Certified Information Systems Security Professional. Um, that credential yeah, you've got to write a test. It's a three-hour test. You have to get a really high score on it. Um, But that's not the only requirement. You also need four years professional practice. Now, there's no requirement in the CISSP program that you're you're mentored through the practice or that you know you're you're apprenticed. They they just say you have to you have to work for four years in the field full time, and then you can get the credential. So I have the credential. Um, So that's sort of one end of the spectrum. Um, sort of in the middle of the spectrum, I think, is the engineering profession. Um, in a lot of jurisdictions, my own, I know I live here in Alberta, Canada, um, the government has mandated a group. Uh, in, in Alberta, it's, uh, you know, APEGA, the Alberta Professional Engineering Geologists and Geophysicists Association. They manage uh, this these professionals. And the engineers especially, um, if you're working on a safety critical stuff like designing a bridge, you've got to stamp everything you produce. You've got to say, yes, I've certified that this design is safe. And uh, when you graduate university, you can't become a member of a PEGA and a, a, a professional engineer in good standing the day you graduate. doesn't matter that you've passed all your tests. There's a period of, I don't know, two or four years or something where you have to work in the profession. And in that time, 
you're supervised very closely because you can't stamp your own safety critical papers. Your boss has to do it. You don't have a stamp yet. You're not a, a full-fledged professional engineer. And so the boss is stamping everything you do. And so the boss is looking at you really close to make sure you've done it right and giving you feedback when you've messed it up because it's their stamp. It's their career that's on the line if they stamp something that isn't safe and you know a catastrophe occurs. So that's sort of a more structured approach. Again, they don't call it an apprenticeship, but you know the the apprenticeship seems to be on the other end of the spectrum, where they're saying, you know, um, you take a course or three, you do some work, you're closely supervised, you take some more courses, you do some more work, and it's sort of a structured way to to get this combination of training and experience, as opposed to sort of these unstructured credentials in in other disciplines. And was that around back when you were getting started? Did you sort of get out of college and then do this whole professional path? No, it, it wasn't at all around. I mean, as far as I know, this is the first time there's this apprenticeship thing happening. Um, you know, my own path, I uh, I wound up, you know, I bounced around between, between roles for a while and I wound up sort of settling into building industrial control systems, leading, uh, you know, software development teams. Um, you know, drifted from that, the next project the business needed me to do was, uh, you know, building middleware, connecting control system networks into enterprise networks, connecting control systems to the, the enterprise resource planning systems, SAP in the day. Um, and then, you know, when that project kind of was done, we had the product that was out there being sold. The next thing they needed me to do, you know, by then the, the, the company had morphed, been sold, uh, you know, renamed. It was now Industrial Defender. They needed me to uh, lead the development of the, the world's first industrial SEM. So I looked around and said, well, SEM, security, um, you know, just like I did with the, the middleware product, uh, you know, I had to learn about this space. So I went out and read, uh, you know, a half dozen books. Um, you know, uh, now, you know, I, I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a techno geek, you know, I was able to get into it. I, I didn't mind reading a half dozen books on the topic. I did take, I think one week of formal training, but no, I, I just, I just drifted into this. So do you think that back then you might have benefited from the kind of apprenticeship that, uh, that Steve is talking about? I probably could have, um, you know, I had to, you know, figure out on my own which books were worth reading. I read a bunch that weren't worth reading that really weren't relevant. Um, so yeah, a little more structure really, I, I think, would have helped. And you know, let's face it, not everybody's the techno geek that I was. Um, the uh, you know, not not everybody wants to spend their evenings reading technical books on on cybersecurity. So uh, yeah, something a little more structured, some some classroom time, some practice time. You know, somebody looking closely over your shoulder and and helping you out. Uh, I think is 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 absolutely uh, a, a benefit. You know, you can't count on on the world to educate themselves. Let's say you've defined a program or six for uh, you know different kinds of positions. Um, who's going to use this? You know, apprenticeships need businesses to hire the apprentices. Uh, you know, apprenticeships need schools to train the apprentices, sort of in between work periods. And the, the apprenticeships I'm familiar with, they're sort of a uh, a few months of schooling, a few months of work alternating. Um, you know, who's who's driving this? Who's funding this? Do you have the educational institutions and, and the businesses lined up already? Well, we certainly have the educational institutions, uh, colleges, uh, universities, uh, and particularly community colleges are very interested in, in doing this. Uh, there's a very large number of cybersecurity programs at two-year schools that are more vocational oriented versus your traditional academics. Uh, we are getting interest from uh, electric utilities in doing this. That takes a bit more so socialization. Uh, traditionally, utilities, at least for security, they've looked to hire ready-made professionals. Um, because there's such a challenge in doing that, there's been an openness to consider this build your own approach. And so that's the message that we're bringing is as we look long-term, uh, we really want to build our own workforce, right? I don't think we want to rely on academia to create the professionals that we need. Academia will play a role in that, but I think having more control of the workforce long-term makes a lot of sense. And again, this is a model that's been used across the utility sector for decades. 
in other areas. So the model's understood. It's just a matter of uh, socializing the idea and getting buy-in that we should be doing the same thing for cybersecurity. Uh, we definitely have interest in that uh, as we look to build out some of the early programs. Once we prove the model with those early adopters, I think there's a strong uh, possibility. I'm, I'm very confident that there'll be a lot of interest and it will gain widespread, widespread adoption across the industry um, over the next several years. So, Steve, that that was a bit of an abstract answer. Um, you know, can you give me some examples of of people that you're working with? Sure, sure, I can tell you. We actually have a, a fairly broad ecosystem involved. Um, first, let me just go back to the Department of Labor grant that is being led by Southern Utah University um, out of Utah, obviously. So they're the grant lead, uh, but we also have several partners on the grant. So EnergySec is a subrecipient on that grant. Um, we have Washington State University assisting. Uh, they're helping with grant management as well as our industry, kind of driving some of our industry uh, back and forth. Uh, we have a, a nonprofit out of Utah that deals with advanced manufacturing. And then there's another a nonprofit uh, uh, that's based out of Michigan that does workforce um, things. Uh, not doing a very good job describing that, but they, they've done workforce development programs nationwide uh, for quite some time. Um, in particular, we're getting a lot of traction in the state of Washington. I mentioned that that earlier, um, but because of uh, some of the partners that we're involved with, with, they have very strong connections with labor and industry in the state of Washington. Um, they've been able to bring the labor organizations in that state uh, to the table for conversations. Um, and then we've worked to bring utilities to the table. Um, so I, I don't think I can name any specific utilities, but uh, we have several of the uh, larger public power entities in the state of Washington, as well as one of the uh, large investor owned utilities that have had conversations with us. They've agreed they want to be part of this process as we work through this and, and, and build this out. Uh, from a national perspective, uh, NRECA, uh, the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, uh, was a supporter of our grant proposal, and they've actually helped us put together a working group from their members, and we're having regular conversations with them, trying to identify specifically what the needs are uh, in their community for the cyber workforce uh, in hopes of putting together a program that meets their needs uh, specifically. So we definitely have uh, help at multiple levels, and we're, we're getting increasing involvement from industry on this. One part of, of uh, Steve's answer there I found interesting. I'm, I'm very curious to know what the NRECA comes up with. You know, NRECA's National Rural Electric Co-op Association Cooperative. These are electric co-ops that are serving typically, you know, small towns, rural areas, farms. Um, they tend to be fairly small utilities. I mean, they have a, a couple of big utilities in there, but most of the, the organization is tiny utilities. And I am curious to know, in these small utilities, what you know, what what are they hiring in terms of industrial cybersecurity skill set? You know, I'm I'm guessing um, they're going to need more generalists than specialists. I'm guessing that they're going to need people that have experience or that you know training or or inclination to work with small organizations where everyone's a generalist, where everyone's doing three jobs. Um, you know, what does that translate to into your training programs? I, I am curious to see what comes out of this, you know, in terms of what the, the NRECA members need versus what very large utilities need. So one part of your answer surprised me there. You know, I know EnergySec to be all about electric power. And the examples you've used, you know, utilities, NERCSIP, even the NRECA, that's all about electric power, different aspects of the electric industry. But you mentioned manufacturing. Is your scope here the electric sector, or is it is it broader than that? Well, our scope is the electric sector. Uh, with the grant, we have uh, advanced manufacturing uh, as part of the grant, and that's being led by an organization called Westcam, uh, and they operate in the state of Utah, um, supporting manufacturers in that state. Uh, they've been around for about thirty years, and so they're driving the manufacturing side. So while EnergySec is not directly involved in that, I think we will have the benefit of what's developed over there, uh, lessons learned, and we can certainly apply those uh, in our community. 
So can we talk about uh, sort of the, the, the bigger picture of, of training and certifications? You know, how does, how does an apprenticeship fit into that bigger picture of, you know, degrees and certificates and whatnot? Well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, traditionally with an apprenticeship, when you complete the apprenticeship, uh, you get at least a certificate or some some acknowledgement that you've completed the program, and that is typically portable within industry. So if you become a journeyman electrician, you can go work for any electrical contractor in, in the nation, right? You can get licensed in any state. Um, our Department of Labor grant specifically requires that any apprenticeship we develop lead to an industry-recognized credential. So that could be an existing certification uh, or it could be something new. Uh, and from Energy Sex perspective, we are very interested and we intend to develop some new credentials um, that will be approved and accepted by industry. So we'll obviously work with industry and, and get buy-in on these. Uh, so as the programs are completed, uh, there, will, there will be an opportunity to obtain that credential. Um, now, you know, you talk about training and certification and credentials and the different terminology. One thing in the security world, there's a lot of certifications and most of them tend to be knowledge-based. So you, you take a class, you take a test, you pass the test, uh, and then you obtain your certification. Um, that's how I got my CISA. That's how we got my CISSP. Some of them require some work experience and others may have some other, other requirements. But the credentials that we're looking to build, we want them to be competency-based. We, we want the evaluation to assure that those who receive the credential have the ability to do certain things um, at some level. So it's not just a, no a knowledge test. Take, take me up a, a bit of a notch. One of the things that we're hoping to do, uh, planning to do, is to build on some previous work that was done several years ago by Pacific Northwest National Labs, or PNNL. Um, this was something that Mike Asante uh, was involved in. Um, he had an organization, NBISC, uh, that was involved in that. And what they did is they worked with industry and they developed some documents identifying the job skills, uh, knowledge, skills, abilities that would be required for what they termed a secure power systems professional or SPSP, or SP squared, as, as I like to call it. And we would really like to build on that. Um, it, it was good work. It's a bit dated, so we're looking to update it and leverage it. And I really like the phrase, secure power systems professional. So we plan to offer credentials under that banner uh, with a penultimate credential, which would be the SP squared, which I see as being that ninja level cybersecurity professional in the industry. Um, beneath that, we'll likely build interim credentials for specific job roles. Um, there might be a you know, secure power uh, intrusion analyst or secure power security analyst or security architect. Uh, and we'll work that out with industry through the groups that we're, we're, we're working with now and, and additional advisor groups that we put together uh, to see how that, how that builds out. But again, the important thing is Demonstrated competency, not merely a knowledge check. You know, Andrew, I'm just curious, um, how many new people are coming through programs like the one that Steve is, is talking about? Um, how many people are getting these certifications every year and entering the industry? Short answer is, is I don't know. Um, and, you know, to an extent, I can't know because, you know, Steve's programs don't exist yet. They're, they're still developing them. I do have one statistic, though. This was a couple of years ago. I saw a study had been done in uh, North America of CISSPs. Now, CISSPs are cybersecurity generally, not industrial security specifically. But generally, they did the study and they reported, look, in North America, there was at the time something like 65, 68,000 CISSPs registered with the with the the organization they, you know there that's how many there were in North America and they the study was uh, of job postings and they said they found uh, 48,000 job postings open in North America requiring a CISSP if you wanted to get hired for the job you had to have a CISSP well most of the 68,000 people in North America who had the CISSP had jobs already 
where are they going to get another 48,000 people? So there does seem to be a demand for, you know, cybersecurity generally. And, you know, I'm assuming industrial security uh, specifically here. That just seems like a massive gap to me. I wonder why it's not being bridged more. You would think that maybe with, with higher wages, or maybe is it uh, a knowledge thing that Lots of people just don't know that they could enter this industry with certain skill sets. I mean, I can tell you that from my generation, a lot of people um, have been attracted to jobs and programming just because um, because of the demand in that industry. They offer high salaries, and so people who would otherwise do other things end up becoming coders. Um, why is that not the case in industrial security? I think it is the case in industrial security. My, you know, but I'm I'm doing some guesswork here. I know that you know I hire people. If I can't find the people that that uh, you know, if I can't find someone who matches the the job spec I've put out, well, I look at who I've got, and sometimes I say, you know, I think this person here's got potential. Um, let's hire them and you know take a risk on them and bring them up the learning curve. And I'm guessing that this happens because you can't get a CISSP straight out of school. As I said, there's a, a four-year professional practice requirement. You first have to get a job that doesn't require a CISSP before you are eligible for the, the credential, even if you've passed the, the, the knowledge test. So my guess is that a lot of these people who are posting for CISSPs had to hire somebody else. And hopefully, presumably over time, the, the people that were hired used the opportunity to, uh, you know, finish their training or take the test and, you know, sp- you know do their time and, and get the credential. And, you know, now they are, uh, you know, sort of in a sense more attractive for, for other people. As an employer, I mean, just a, as an aside, as an employer, you know, I recognize this, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit of a, a, a catch-22. You hire people, you know, you pay to get them trained, you pay other people in the organization to bring them up the learning curve, and then they get the credential, and then you have to pay them more because they have the credential. But this is the way it works. This is this is the nature of the beast. You know, the, the employers are used to this. In the beginning of our conversation, you mentioned the Energy Sec conference that's been going on for 16 years. I mean, that's one of the longest running, uh, you know, industrial security conferences ever. Um, can you talk a little more about that conference? I mean, I know you guys are heavy into NERC SIP. Is the conference all about NERC SIP? Is it about, you know, security? Is it about the energy sector? Is it about training? Uh, you know, do I get training at this conference? What What is that conference? Yes, well, first of all, it's it's not a NERC SIP conference. Uh, we do have some NERC SIP related content, but this is really, we try to focus it on cybersecurity. Uh, it is energy focused and typically the content is more electric sector focused. So it's a, it's a bit of a niche conference, but we've had discussions about pipelines and gas and things like that. Um, this year, I think pipelines are an interesting topic given, uh, events that have been in the news. So it's a, um, relatively small event. Usually we run about 175 attendees, but it has a great vibe, has that family vibe, um, We've moved it around over the years, but we've really settled on the Anaheim Disney location. We found a lot of folks like to bring their families, come down and enjoy the park. Uh, It's a great venue for conferences. Uh, It's a great venue on a personal level as well. So, uh, you know, we try try to have a conference where we have some good, compelling content. Uh, It's a typical presentation and panels. We do breakouts on day one, uh, and we do sometimes have some educational sessions kind of i won't call it training per se but educational sessions on on day one uh but we really like to push the hallway tracks um that i think is the great benefit of going to an in-person conference and we're very happy to be able to get back to doing that post covid so i invite anybody who's listening uh, to check it out and maybe we'll see you down there at disneyland in october well this has been great steve thank you for joining us uh before we let you go is there a thought you'd like to leave with our listeners well, I'm just going to, you know, issue that generic call to action. I'd like to encourage everybody to to get involved. Uh, you know, I know we all have mortgages to pay and we have to work and, and make money to do that. But giving a little bit back to the community is something we can all do. So from a cybersecurity workforce perspective, there's a big need out there. And those of us who've been in the industry for a while, we need to be doing our part to help bring up the next uh, the next round of workers, the next generation of workers. 
So there's a variety of ways to do that. We'd obviously love to have people contact us here at EnergySec and get involved in things that we're doing. Um, a lot of ways to help. You can help us design credentials, uh, give input into the design of our apprenticeship programs, build curriculum, teach classes, be a mentor, lots of ways to, to volunteer and help us out. There's also other organizations that you can get involved with or informally within your own company. Uh, reach out to someone who's newer to the profession and, and be a mentor. Um, encourage them. Uh, help them out with something they're struggling with. It's a very big problem we have to face, uh, but it's a very important one. We need to solve it. We need to win the battle, uh, and we need to have our workforce in industrial security be the workforce that we need. And so do whatever you can to help make that happen. Andrew, how about a last word? Sure. Uh, I mean, Steve just sort of gave a call to action here to gurus in the field who can, you know, contribute knowledge to the process of defining these these credentials and these programs. Let me flip the coin. Um, you know, to me, the other big ask that, that went on said is if you're a power utility or, you know, anybody really, in, in, he's also doing advanced manufacturing. If, if you're somebody who's having trouble hiring industrial security people, call up EnergySec, get involved, maybe get some apprentices working for you to help, you know, give feedback into the program, uh, but certainly get input into the program to make sure the program is producing the kinds of people that you're having trouble hiring. And yeah, on that note, I'd just like to throw in a last word of my own. Um, you know, over the years, I've been able to speak with a few of our listeners who come across our podcast because they're new to industrial security. They find us, you know, everything's a little confusing to them. You know, talking about this stuff can sort of help clarify things. But still, it's a, it's a relatively intimidating industry. As we've talked about, you sometimes need to have years and years of experience just to have the right qualifications for the right job. Um, and that can be a lot. So I think that your conversation with Steve really highlights, for me at least, that there is that path forward, that people out there should know that there are organizations looking for bright people who are interested in learning, even if you don't have that experience, that it should be very validating. So for that, I'd like to thank Steve Parker for speaking with you, Andrew. And as always, Andrew, thank you for speaking with me. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Nate. This has been the Industrial Security Podcast from Waterfall. Thanks to everyone out there listening. Thank you.